Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Daniel Butnaro, and I work in uh, research and early development in Roche, at Roche Pharma. Um, over the last year, uh, me, I mean myself, together with my colleagues, we worked quite a lot on increasing the degree of automation in research and the drug discovery part. Now, when I first heard about this project, I actually asked myself, automation in research? What is there to automate in research? Isn't research something super dynamic, changing every day? A method which is valid today is not valid tomorrow. I need to change always the direction and so on. And I was a bit puzzled, but it does turn out, at least in, in the pharma research, that there is a lot of stuff that you can actually automate. And this is something that I would like to share with you today and see what was our rationale and what was also our path of getting there to our fundamental concepts. Now, um, maybe in the last few seconds you already accepted this implicit assumption that automation is a good thing to do in research, right? And let me assure you, it is indeed a good thing to do. Now the question is, why do we need to do it? I mean, what is our purpose? What is our goal? What do we want to solve? What's our problem? So let's get in down into it, and let's look at something very big. Yeah? This is the full drug development process that you have in the industry right now. This has been the same for maybe a few decades now, and it usually consists of these phases here, where on the left-hand side, we have the basic research into new diseases, new modes of operation, and so on, and on the Right-hand side, we have a drug which actually lands on the market and does something valuable and meaningful. Now, in between, we see a certain structure here. The blue part, we can call it something like drug discovery, like finding the right candidate, which is good, or at least is promising. And on the green part is evaluating that candidate through clinical studies and so on. And the last part is really the approval of the medicine and is really its monitoring after it has been released. Now. If you also look at the years, how long these phases take, you see that in your best case, you will release a drug to the market in seven years, and in the worst case, it's around 15 years. So it's a tremendously very long process to get something done, and that is something which has to be improved, or at least we're working to improve on, upon. Now, if we focus a bit on these white lines that we see here, all these, like, starting from the left to the right, we see kind of a pattern where we have a lot of stuff and it becomes less and less and less stuff. And these things usually are the compounds or the leads that you usually try to assess if they're good in, in curing a certain disease. So basically, there are a lot of them, and what usually happens is you have a lot of leads but very few successes, which makes this process very expensive and very time-consuming. And myself and my colleagues, we are mostly in this blue part here, in the blue area, and trying to optimize this part so it gets faster, so we can get, we can get to the end result in a significant less time. Now, on top of this already existing process for years now, there are a few new things now which came on the market. So there are a few disruptors which challenge the research activity even more. One of them is that there are no more low-hanging fruits. So there are no more drugs which just work for a large population. Now, there's, you would double your investment in research, but you only get a 20% return on it. So it's very expensive to find new drugs which really work for, for, let's say, a broad population. At the same time, there are new drugs and working methods on the market. And these can include gene therapy, which is happening right now, and also personalized health care is coming very high, where because there are no drugs which work for everybody, but there are drugs which work for certain categories of population, which means that also the research activity is diversifying quite a lot to deal with the different groups that you have. And on top of that, of course, there's commercial pre pressure. There are very new, new players on the market. And uh, this ups, ups the, the, the degree of complexity and the speed that we need to achieve. Now, if you sum up all these requirements together, you realize that actually what the research laboratories need, they need to go in two directions. Yeah? They want to become more flexible due to all these new methods and new ways. And they also want to increase the throughput because they don't want to try so many things, or they do want to try them, but get faster to a conclusion. Is this good or not? Should I follow this or not? And it, as a computer scientist, you would say to somebody, well, if you want flexibility, you're going to re reduce your throughput. If you want throughput, you're going to reduce your flexibility. You can't really have both. 
The thing is that we do want to have both, and this is where we are working with business process modeling and Camunda to achieve this goal of having everything. Now, how does a lab usually look like? I mean, it can look like this one. This is the Crick Institute in London. It's a very nice open space. People, uh, there are no offices assigned to anybody. You arrange based on your project and you discuss and so on. So absolutely flexible environment. Or you can have a lab which looks like this, which is devoid of people. There's actually only one person somewhere in the corner there. And you have all these instruments together, tightly connected, doing one task at, at, the, um, at a time, and really having this high throughput. Where we want to go, we like to combine these two things together. Now, remember the big picture with the entire drug development process, right? Let's focus on the blue part, which is the drug discovery process, where I am active and where also my colleagues together with me are working on this automation. Now, the goal here in drug discovery is to find a molecule which has an affinity to a certain target. That uh, molecule, it's usually called, an, um, it's called um, can be an antibody. There are many types, but let's take this one as an example. It's an antibody, and your target is usually called an antigen. Is something, is a molecular compound, which is expressed, which is present, on something, and let's focus on cancer immunotherapy for now, and that something is usually present on a cancer cell, is being exposed on the outside of the cell, for example, and your drug, your, 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 your lead, let's call that also lead for this presentation, it will attach to that target and then trigger an immune response. That means that your T cells will, at, will attack and destroy that cancer cell. This is one way of, of, of dealing with, with such a things. So the drug, the entire drug discovery, wants to go from antigen to antibody. And in between, there are a few phases. First of all, you need to assess your target. There are many targets. Not all of them are good. Not all of them are reachable. Then you want to find your first leads, that means your first few antibodies, which actually work, even attached to this target. And then, once you have them, you would like to optimize them because they're not all of them are good. Some of them have very uh, unfortunate side effects. Some of them are actually really not good, so you, want to, you just want to reduce those. Remember this funneling activity happening in the diagram. And the last part is just because you found one which is very good, it also doesn't mean you can actually produce it uh, at scale. So these are also additional criteria criterias into looking in this area. Now, let's continue zooming. And I, I promise you we're getting to BPMN very soon. So let's continue zooming in into this phase now. So let's just pick lead identification. Again, we see here a lot of subphases here happening. Preparing the antigen, immunization, uh, hybridome fusion, primary screening, uh, amplifying the quantity that we have so we can do something and purifying it because it has a lot of impurities. And then we get to functional assays, which are investigative procedures for assessing various properties of these antibodies, of these leads. And now we're getting very close to processes. Because if you look what's behind all these phases, there are a lot of assays. So they have different names, they have different purposes, and they characterize, they measure, they purify. There are very few. And there are a bunch, I think there are about hundreds in the, in the, in the pharma the research area. And this is where we're getting very close to business process modeling, because if you look at one of those assay, assay you see that you can actually model as a BPN process. Yeah? So here we get very close, very close to Kamunda. And what do you usually see? Now, uh, forget about what's inside the boxes, but what you typically see in this assay is that it has three phases. You have the first part where you are configuring it. That means the researcher is entering some parameters, he's validating some inputs, he's preparing for his activity. Then you have the second phase, the middle part, where you ha usually have a robot doing an execution, and that can be various different types of robots doing something. And the last part, after the robot running successful, is collecting the results, processing them, and putting them in all the backend systems that you have uh, around you. So that's a typical structure of an essay. And luckily enough, this structure repeats itself in most of the essays. And then you come to this idea, well, what if I describe all my essays as BPMAN processes, chain them together, and try to depict my entire discovery process? That's a great idea, right? This is where we want to go. Before we get there, let's look a bit behind what kind of systems are actually talking about in this pharma research world. So if you look at there are a few capabilities, base capabilities. I'm not going to go into too many details, which are available in any pharma company. You need to store metadata. You have ontologies for, for having controlled vocabulary, so everybody speaks the same language. Uh, you have ontologies. You have unique identifiers, very important. Um, you have essay descriptions, analytical data coming from instruments, and biomarkers lately also happening. 
And these are like base capabilities. And on these base capabilities, you have a lot of systems which integrate them, which combine them. You can have something like inventory systems, omics, data management systems, genomics, proteomics, and so on, machine learning analytics, um, lab data automation, which preoccupies me at the moment, and of course, data lakes and warehousing. And all these, say, these colored uh, boxes here, they're actual systems which have APIs. That means that our automation landscape consists of these systems which have APIs, and what we want to do is to map assays as a traversal between these systems in order to achieve a certain activity, in order to fulfill this assay. And this is exactly what we did. Yeah? So we are describing, the, 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 say, the, the connection between the assay and the different functionality that it needs as a BPMN process. That means that behind these boxes, there are, there's glue code which talks to these backend systems in order to do a particular task. With the added advantage, of course, for us, because remember our keyword flexibility, when we have a new process which might change, for example, might happen every six months that we have to readjust the processes, is that we just redefine our process in the modeler, we change a bit the glue code, but the backend systems that we have inside the organization are unchanged and are still providing the functionality they used to. So this is the approach that we are following quite uh, heavily. Now, where do we want to go? Our vision here is that we map all our assays using business process modeling. And then we end up with such a collection of, of processes where, for the first time in the organization, we can really look inside the research activity and we can see what is running, how often does it run, is it has, does it have redundancies to other processes, and this way, go into the next phase where we can try to maybe transform the way we do the research by looking at these processes holistically and really trying to optimize the activity uh, behind them. This is our goal. Now, this is a goal, this is a vision, and in order to support this, we also need an architecture. We need a way of, of going there and doing that. And the architecture that we follow is pretty simple, I would say, at least from the high level. So we have roughly, let's, let's say we have um, four participants in this architecture. On the top layer, we have Kamunda as our orchestrator, which really drives the different tasks which are actually happening inside the essays. Classical situation here. Now, we distinguish between three types of tasks. We have the user task, where the user actually has to enter input data, validate, make decisions, and so on. We have so-called device tasks, which are tasks which involve a full run on a particular robot um, in the research uh, laboratories. And we have data transformation tasks, which are tasks which do some sort of data wrangling. It can be something very simple by just talking to a backend system, or it can be even a computation that you're doing um, uh, on data. And uh, behind the device task, there's a device broker handling all the execution of these tasks, and behind the data transformation task is a data transformation broker. So we use a lot of this concept of brokers in, in the sense that we are forwarding the activities to be done to the other systems in the back with some custom glue code that we have. Another thing that it turned out that we actually need a lot is to handle data which gets produced by a task and needed by the next one. And of course, you can always make the systems know each other, which is also a possibility, but we try to avoid that as much as possible. And we have some kind of an intermediary storage, we can call it like that, which is an object store, and I'll get to this in a second, which is kind of a, pla it's a place where you put the data while it's in transit, as long as the process is actually executing. And when the process finishes, you don't need it anymore. You can just flush everything. Okay, now let's dig down into some of these components that we have here in this architecture. Devices. Okay, first let's clarify what do we mean by robots or devices in our setup. So here are a bunch of them that you find them everywhere in the laboratories. So you have devices such as mass spectrometers, which are very good at uh, measuring mass, as the name also says it. There are chromatographs, which are very good at, at separating things and, and, and purifying things. There are very and a bunch, a lot of liquid handlers. There are so many liquid handlers. You. Um, and what these guys usually do is they just keep on pipetting things in different directions, mixing and, and matching and filtering and so on. So it, it's crazy what goes on on these robots inside there. So this is the robots we're actually talking about when we talk about robots in this presentation. And now, if you look a bit in this automation world of, of robots and so on, what you always see is that how people tackle this is by using abstraction upon abstraction upon abstraction upon abstraction. So when you're dealing with a robot, 
you of course have the actual instrument, which is a very low level instrument, and that one has servos, has sensors, has everything on it. And you don't want to touch that from a business process model. It's way too messy, and it's just not the right tool. What you usually have is that the vendors have an instrument, so-called instrument control system, which is a piece of software that runs on a computer next to a robot, which does all this, all this stuff for you, so you have a higher level API. Even that's not sufficient, because it might be high level, but not high enough. So on top of that, you usually have a process control system, which orchestrates different robots that they work together. For example, that the robot A, uh, is connected to robot B over some kind of a street where you're transporting, for example, the sample, which is also a higher level. And the last on the top, you have business process management, because at this level is the level that you like to talk to your robots. You don't really care about all the details which happen down, very down in the layers. You just want to tell the robot, please do this and tell me when you're done. That's what you want to do from a business perspective point of view. Now. We follow this approach, so we are, let's say, aligning ourselves to this approach, and our implementation is as follows. We just take the instrument and its process control system, its, its, its computer, which sits next to it, and we install a connector on it. It's a piece of custom code that we have, and this connector has the job to connect to this IoT hub that we have inside the organization, which is exactly the device broker that was mentioned on the other uh, slides. So basically, this connector is doing all the low-level communication with the vendor software, while on the top, it's talking to our device broker, which does the interaction with the Kamunda um, uh, orchestration engine. So this is the way that we integrate these things. Also here, the data, there's a lot of data coming from these instruments, as the be it inputs that they need, be it outputs that they produce. And this data, we usually also, over the connector, we pipe it to exactly to this object store that we uh, saw on the previous slide. So the data goes there, and only the reference to the data is actually being returned to the IoT hub in order to go to the next tasks. So this is the way that we think about how do we integrate these devices. Now, let's focus on this box at the top, at the very high top, uh, where the IoT hub is pointing up because that is Kamunda. Yeah, that is a process running in, uh, in Kamunda. How does it look like? This is one example of one of our robots, and this is the diagram behind it. So what do we see here? So we have a few things going on here. First of all, we have a fundamental process in dealing with, with research robots, is that we only configure them, we monitor their execution, and we collect the results. We don't control them. That is very important because this is not that kind of automation where you just start a robot because you can. Uh, you cannot do it here because it depends on a person actually loading the robots properly with material and other things. So you cannot just start it. You could, of course, technically, but it makes no sense. So we have to, through our diagram, we just have to monitor the robot and try to deduct when a certain state change has happened. So let's walk through this diagram a bit. So the first thing that happens is that we generate, in this case, is a work list. This is kind of the input that the robot usually uh, needs. It looks like kind of like a CSV file, a very long CSV file, which describes what is the robot supposed to do, actually. Now, OK, we have this upper branch here in case we, we are not actually in production. We want to simulate it that we, we need to do. And the next thing, this is the first command which goes to the IoT hub, is to download this work list to the connector. And the connector now puts the work list on a particular place where the software, the vendor software, needs it in order to work. After we finish with this, then we start listening. We just have to wait and see until the user has actually started the process on the robot. There's a correlation ID in the background to make sure that we know that the right process has been started and so on. But this is exactly what happens. So the Diagram here shows that the user, there's a user task there where the user can say himself, I have started it. But if he forgets to do that, no problem. There is an event attached to that box where we know, because the connector is telling us, that the robot has just started with the work list that you have just configured. And then we can advance in our process with our diagram. And start is good, but what we need is finish. We need it to finish. And that is also the second event that we are waiting. And with that available, then we go and do the most important part for us is collecting the results which have been produced by this robot. And this is, again, the task of the connector, which grabs the binary files which have been produced and pushes them to the object store that we have uh, available for the tasks. So basically, this is a bit the, the way that we integrate robots. And this is the same pattern we follow for all of them. 
And this is also a pattern which allows us to extend later. Maybe we do want to control. It's possible for certain instruments. And this is, we have the possibility of, of playing here around with different concepts in order to achieve that. Now, data wrangling. So, of course, all these backend systems, they're not going to adapt to our uh, business process modeling uh, needs. Yeah? We need some kind of code now and then in between our models and our backend systems to do these tasks, do certain transformations, to prepare certain data. And this is what we are doing with uh, the data transformation broker. And I actually forgot to say something very important. Uh, we are using exclusively external clients here. So Kamunda is just running standalone, and everything is an external task be it device tasks, be it these data transformation tasks. And we have a Python broker, which is an external task client, which now and then checks to see, are there any new data transformations for me? And based on the type of the data transformation, it delegates this operation to the, to the corresponding backend system, or it does it itself if it's a particular calculation which is nowhere to be found. Yeah, so this is how we can extend with functionality for us. And how do we configure the broker? How we configure this task is very, very straightforward. So because all our service tasks are external task clients, um, there is a topic. And for the data transformation broker, there's a particular name for that topic. I think it's data transformation something, underlying broker. I forgot exactly. But what's more important is how do we tell the broker which operation to actually do? And that's being done by using the input parameters to the task. Because the input parameters themselves actually contain the name of the backend, or let's say of the script, which is going to be executed in the broker. In this case, the script name is um, mpure register purification plate. And if you look at this, um, it co what corresponds to this name is a Python script. We can see it on the right. And it's very simple, very straightforward. It has a very simple run method where you enter with the, all the variables that you need and a bucket ID to know where to put the data when you're finished. And based on this information that you have, you start doing any particular type of transformation that you have. It can be something very simple, where you just call a backend system and tell it, OK, please register this. Or it can be something more complex, where you're doing a bit of heavy lifting in the sense that you're computing some concentrations or something like that. And you can, of course, return new variables which are injected into the process for the follow-up tasks. So this is, this is our way of dealing with, with computation here. And it serves us quite well so far, at least. Now, the last component in the architecture is the data exchange. I mean, we are noticed quite early for ourselves is that um, you cannot put uh, our large variables, binary files, especially in Kamunda. You can, of course. It's probably a very bad idea. So we had to figure out a way of having some place we, which we can use like a staging area where we put data, which is only valid or needed during the process execution. And for us, the solution is pretty straightforward. So we use an object store, an S3 compatible object store, um, because everything we do is on premise. This is usually is Minio, uh, Minio, uh, which is basically mimicking an S3, S3 compatible API. And we use it from either from the brokers, either from the connectors, from wherever we need to exchange data and we need to push data around into our uh, organization. And data to the object store can come from different places. It can be from the connectors, from the bottom. Uh, a user task, the user can upload a file uh, to this object store. It goes there. Or a data transformation task grabs a file, does some changes on it, and puts it back into the object store for the next task down the line to deal with it. So this is the critical component that we actually need. OK. Now, let's come to the last part of the presentation, is that uh, what we notice for ourselves is that we need a platform. I mean, everybody needs a platform. But we particularly, we are very uh, interested in having a platform for the reason is that these essays, there are a lot of them. There are hundreds of them. It is impossible for a certain small group to just start, de de um, first of all, describing all them as, as business process models and so on because the knowledge about how these essays are actually executed is everywhere distributed in the organization, in the different laboratories, in different departments. That also means that our modeling is quite challenging. We can just model once and just deploy and forget about it. We have to redeploy processes, and they are coming from various different stakeholders. That means that we have to think a lot is how to make this process creation, deployment, uh, as flexible as possible so everybody can be on it. 
not just some people there in, in, in a room there which figure, oh, this is the process that we need in our organization. They, these people don't exist for us. They're everywhere. So how do we give them access to deploy processes, to model, and also to do data transformation? That's our focus. But before we get there, one thing that we notice is, is that also a learn, something that we learn a bit the hard way, is that if you model processes without actually thinking how the organization is actually being distributed and how people actually work on these essays, it can be very dangerous. Because if you look at how essays are done, departments are specialized on essays. They're very good in doing certain things, and other departments are good in doing other things. That also means that when you model, you should really consider this because it has an implication then on the way that you can debug processes, assign responsibilities, assign permissions, authorization, authentication to these processes in order to make sure that the right department is doing the right essays. And usually, also because these processes are so long, not everybody in the organization can just can understand the entire process. They, they, they prefer to have a, a focus on what, what is the job to be done for that particular department. And for us, we don't know if it's a good solution or long term. We have split our essays into rather, let's say, two, three essays combined. And in between departments, we are forwarding, the, let's say, the handovers to our internal requesting system, which then triggers the next process in the next department. So this is a one way that we're dealing with this at the moment, at least. We also have this grand vision of connecting everything together, all BPMN-based, but we have to see how do we get there. Now, let's go back to the platform uh, thought. We do have, so we are splitting mentally, but also the way that we have our software, we are splitting our functionality in something that we have, it's called a platform, and something which is called content on top of that platform. And what is everywhere? What is where? So. In the platform, we have a custom UI, so we're not using Kamunda's uh, task UI, we have Angular 5 custom UI that it's well suited for the way that we display essays and the way the essays make sense for our users. And in this custom UI, there are various UI elements which are valuable for different areas. And this is something that we offer as a platform internally. We are maintaining the, the brokers, and this is the Python computing, this is the backend API libraries that we have there, which makes life more, way more easier to deal with these backend systems because we already done it in some libraries in Python. And of course, we're maintaining our connectors and all this infrastructure to deal with the devices in the, in the, in the organization. What the users can do, they can focus on the upper part, and that's what we call content, they can deploy processes, so they are the owners of the processes, and they can also deploy these scripts, which are the transformations. And these are always contributed by the users. And they are versioned based on the users, and they are managed by the users. It's not even in our responsibility. We are taking care of the platform, but they are investing a lot of uh, energy and effort into this content. Because for us, this is the only way we can really scale in this kind of organization, where knowledge is not in one place, it's everywhere, and everybody needs to participate into modeling, which is something very interesting. And with this, I would like to conclude. <laughs> These are not the right slides, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'll conclude myself. So the, the research process is really all about essays. So we have various different activities which happen. and we found out that if we take these essays and if we model them as executable BPMN processes, then we go a long way into having something which is described, visible, and for the first time in the organization, even people really can see how things are connected together. And surprisingly, when people you invite several people to discuss do the, to the process modeling, for the same department, there's a, such a lengthy discussion about what's the right process that I always enjoy this because you know, this is the right discussion. At the end, we're going to have a process which everybody agrees upon, and that's fantastic to do, to do this. Then, device integration, you don't have to go deep. We have a so-called shallow integration where we just configure, monitor, collect, nothing more. And that's sufficient to work with this very already highly integrated robotics platform where you don't need to go deep, uh, deep into, their, uh, into their understandings. And the last thing, is that I'd like to share with you, and I'd also like to stress this thing, which turned out to be very important for us, is to open modeling and process and scripting to everybody in the organization and make them the owners of the processes on a backbone that you are offering to everybody. And this way, you can see that your coverage um, of all the processes increases dramatically because people really enjoy defining this, and they really enjoy seeing that running. And you're going to fill in this entire landscape with processes way more faster than you would do with just a few people in, in, in one room. Thank you very much for your attention.